Hi there, this is John Evans, and welcome back to Book and Spade. Today's episode will be dedicated to the miracle of Christmas, the miracle of the incarnation of Christ. Now, most of us believe we understand the miracle of God becoming man. And yet, recently, I came across an archaeological fact which made me reevaluate this season. Back in the 1880s, the Sisters of Nazareth, a group of nuns, built their convent above an unknown site. To them, it looked like a tomb complex with a series of cisterns or vaults. Local legends stated that they were building on top of the tomb of a saint, but they didn't know who this saint happened to be, and most of them simply were focused on their theological mission. Now, throughout the course of the 20th century, many excavated around the walls. Certain artifacts were recovered, but very few people took any notice. Until in 2001, the Nazareth Archaeological Project was given permission to dig at the site. In 2006, a figure by the name of Ken Dark actually was able to determine that this was not a tomb complex. Instead, it was a first century Jewish home. And in fact, he believed that it could potentially be the Church of the Nutrition. Now, when you hear the Church of the Nutrition, you think, what? The Church of Vitamins? Of Minerals? No. It was a site around the 7th century believed to be the traditional home of the young child Jesus, where Mary and Joseph helped raise the Son of God. And what is interesting about this site is it was fairly well cataloged in the 7th century. We had a description of a well. There is a well at this site in Nazareth. We have a description of a large cavern um, and natural stone walls that are built into a hill and two tombs. Now, one of these tombs has been labeled the Tomb of the Just. And it is traditionally believed by some, although not by all, that this is the tomb of St. Joseph. At this site were found several pottery shards. Pottery is how we date sites from this period. But what really caught my attention, more than any other artifact found at the site, including limestone jars um, used to associate it with the Jewish household because of the purity or kosher laws, was a spindle. A spindle and some pieces of female jewelry that would have been owned by a particular woman at this site. Now, Ken Dark is not willing to confess that this absolutely is the location of the childhood home of Jesus. But it is believed by most who have come to see the spindle and these pieces of jewelry, these glass beads, that they could have belonged to the mother of God, to Mary. More than any other artifact we have discussed so far in the series, this series of artifacts we are discussing now hinges upon the figures who have changed human history and the individual, the Christ, who has shaped my own. Most of us think we know the Christmas story. We believe that we are familiar with the three wise men arriving with the shepherds to bow before the baby Jesus. And we see these images in stained glass. We see these images carved in stone. And as a result, they are sanitized for us. I love my icons. I own several for reasons of veneration and of my own practice as a Roman Catholic. But I think it's time to take a step back and see the reality of this moment. Most of us have a hard time grasping an infinite God, the God who created all things visible and invisible, as we say in the Nicene Creed, becoming a human being. This was radical for the Jews of Christ's day to grasp. So much so that when he said statements like, before Abraham was, 
I am. Many took up stones to kill him, although they could not, for his time had not yet come, until, of course, the crucifixion. But what is most fascinating about the time of Christmas is the political response. Now, most of us now talk a lot about the war on Christmas. Particularly in conservative political arenas, we hear how the secular world is fighting against the very person of Christ. And I have to say, as time has gone on, I've seen this occurring slowly but surely. But this is nothing new. When the wise men arrived from the east, they arrived at the court of a despotic king whose name was Herod, Herod the Great. He was a client of the Roman Empire. He wasn't necessarily a practicing Jew. He was a man who simply ruled by power and with an iron fist. And as soon as he heard about, of course, a new king of the Jews, what did he do? He sent soldiers to murder to massacre the, the innocent, two years and up. Now, that's a bloody reality. We hardly focus on that when we turn up the pages for Christmas. And there are many people, like Herod now, who would want to expunge and erase the memory of the Christ from our public lives. And it is our duty as Christians, or even as hopefully explorers of the truth, to understand that such movements have a darker motivation diabolic one. I also would like to draw emphasis to the wise men. Now we see image, images now and again of these three figures, often hooded and cloaked, arriving before the manger, and we think, how quaint. Sometimes we call them three kings. But if we go back to the biblical narratives, in Matthew and in Luke, it is in Matthew that they appear. The number of the wise men who appear are never actually referenced. They are in the plural and yet, we know that they give three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when they arrive at the court of Herod, an interesting fact is given. We're told that all of Jerusalem was troubled. Now, how would the whole of this great city be troubled by the arrival of only three men? Makes no sense. Well, there are a few alternative possibilities. Now, if we believe that there are clear predictions of the coming of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and we do. Then we know that when Daniel was in the land of Babylon, he was among the Magi of the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. And in doing so, he conversed with the scholars of that time and that period. The Magi were a certain class of scholars, court magicians, as it were, who attended the Babylonian kings. Now, as time went on, it is possible, I'm not suggesting that this is definitive, this is simply a hypothesis, that Daniel could have passed on knowledge of the coming king to a certain sect of magi at the court. The Babylonians, or Persians, eventually become the Parthians, of the future, because of course Babylon was conquered by Cyrus the Persian, and over time the Parthian Empire, during the time of the first century, many years later, becomes a chief contender, a rival, to even the Roman Empire. And as a result, when the wise men, or magi, arrive in Jerusalem, it is possible, I'm not saying that this is definitive, that they could have arrived with a military escort from the rivals to the Romans. And they could have arrived in force, challenging, in some ways, the hegemony of the power of Rome through their client, King Herod. This is very evident in the discussion the wise men have with Herod the Great. Um, the wise men ask, Something along the lines, I'm going off of memory here, uh, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Now, Herod the Great, the despotic king working with the Romans, believes himself to be the king of the Jews. And therefore, when he hears this question, we read it as simply an innocent inquiry, but it would have been a jab, a political jab, at Herod's strength and, and his power. 
because Herod was not born necessarily an Orthodox practicing Jew. Furthermore, what is very interesting about the gifts of the Magi, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, what we don't realize is that these represent the aspects of Christ's personality. It was established, if my memory serves me, at the Council of Chalcedon, the natures of Christ, that he is true God and true man, being the second person, the Son, in the Holy Trinity. And if we look at the gold, it represents Christ's kingship, his role as the monarch, the king of kings. If we look at the incense, many have said it represents Christ's priesthood, as well as his divinity. And if we look at myrrh, one scholar and Jesuit priest who I've met in the past has suggested myrrh was used for embalming, for death. Why death? It seems that even from the start, and if we read the Messianic prophecies, particularly the end chapters of Daniel, we know that the Messiah will be cut off, and we have predictions that he will rise again upon the third day, even at Christ's nativity, through the gifts of the Magi, we see a prediction of the death and resurrection, the divinity and humanity of Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel. This is radical. This is not something you're going to hear in your Sunday school. And some of it is built, I will admit, on supposition. However, as we have seen by looking at the political situation of the time, the problems associated with God becoming man would eventually erupt and lead to great controversy even during the life, the adult life of Christ. And even for the early church, they were persecuted because they said that it was Christ who was Lord. Now, we should think of the title Lord in an interesting context here. When we use the word God in this context, for the Jews, it meant something very specific. It meant the God who was the monotheistic creator of the world. yod heh or sometimes spoken as Yahweh or Jehovah. And this God was responsible for the creation of the world out of nothing, ex nihilo. In Hebrew, tohu vabahu. This God is very different from the pagan gods of mythology who create the world out of other substances. This is the only deity. Therefore, if a Jew were to call anyone else God or Lord, it would be blasphemous. Therefore, it is noteworthy that the early Christians who arrived out of Judaism, we look at figures such as Thomas in the Gospel of John, call Christ my Lord and my God, that clearly identifies Christ with exactly who he says he is, the I am, Yahweh. A man claimed to be the creator of the world. And if I would like for a moment to go back to C.S. Lewis's argument, you can't escape this. Either Christ is exactly who he says he is, the Adonai Elohim. You know, he was nailed on a cross of wood, yet he created the hill on which it stood. Or he is not. And yet the earliest statements of the gospel and of the creeds affirm this fact. Also, too, we learn from the earliest narratives of the life of Christ that he exhibits now and again a clear statement of his humanity as well. We see a child at the temple in the Gospel of Luke who, of course, is hidden from his parents for three days. Joseph and Mary are looking for the child Jesus and they find him in the temple. And, of course, Christ says, Oh, you know, clearly you should have found me here, for I am in my father's house. 
But what is interesting about this tender moment are the statements which follow it. We read that he returned home, was obedient to his mother, and that he grew in wisdom. Now, I'm not quite sure what the statement grew in wisdom means. After all, trying to understand the childhood of Christ is far beyond my own faculties, and probably far beyond any theologians. However, it seems to me that in that statement that he was obedient to his parents, at least to his foster father, Joseph, and to his real and genuine mother, Mary, um, that he had an understanding of what family means. We live in a society, currently now in the West, where I believe I heard one statistic, over 50% of marriages are falling apart. We've cheapened, in some ways, the very essence of what it means to be bound by familial bonds. Father and son, mother and daughter, brother and sister. And I think one of the greatest messages I could give you this Christmas is the fact that we see God most when we look into the eyes of those who we love most and see there an image of a child created by the living God. As you sit around the table, as you cut the turkey or whatever you do, the chicken, the steak, just remember that we are united not simply as close relatives, but every single soul around us is living a human life that Christ partook of. When he took on flesh, we read in the beginning of John, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And to those who would receive him, gave he them the ability to become sons and daughters of God. So I wish you all a very merry and blessed Christmas. I wish you all remember the true humanity and power and divinity of our Lord Christ. I encourage you to continue to investigate. The archaeological evidence I have given you here is built upon some minimal research I have done over the past 24 hours. Now, before I leave you, I would like to share a very important anecdote. Three years ago, I spent a very different Christmas from the one I'm spending now. I was at that point, as many of you well know, diagnosed with a brain tumor. And this was before I knew I didn't have an aneurysm at the time they said I also had one. So I spent Christmas visiting a hospital in Philadelphia. I walked through aisles where there were children weeping. I sat with my mother, unsure of whether I would frankly be in a bodily position to enjoy the preceding year after a very difficult surgery. And as I passed th these very horrible scenes, I couldn't help but ask myself, what is the meaning in all of this? And there, as I sat down, my aunt, whose name is Mary and my godmother, handed me a small crucifix. And for the first time in a long time, as I held this small olive wood cross in my hands, I began to realize that my God went through precisely the pangs of death and by his stripes, healing was possible. Resurrection and a new day could become a reality. This Christmas, three years after the fact, I know I am able to appreciate what I do now far, far more. I look forward to embracing my aunt, my godmother, and my own mother, and remembering what it must have been like for Christ, the Son of God, to embrace his mother Mary. So in this spirit, I wish you all the blessings in the world. Merry Christmas, and Godspeed.